guys look ready. You look so ready with big notebook and a pen. You have, you are in the right position as Mr. Clashman ordered you to be. I'm ready. Um, I am so ready. I, I've been waiting for this moment for several months. I'll tell you a little tiny story. Um, every summer I teach at Kenyon College um, and I run a summer theater institute there and, and we have a great time and I've been doing it for over 20 years. And every summer, for all these years, I've been running into Tyler at Kenyon College in the middle of this country. And we see each other and we wave. And, um, and Tyler has been in charge of the Young Writers Program at Kenyon College. And as you guys move into high school, that's a program for you writers. That's a program that you're going to want to look into. A couple of our St. Gregory students have attended that Writers Program as high school students. And it's amazing. And so we both run these really cool programs somewhere other than our, well, other than my home. And we see each other once a year and we wave and we sit close to each other in the, in the dining hall and, and we admire each other's work for many, many years. And then, suddenly, I realized that Tyler's here in Tucson. And Tyler, this year, has become the new executive director of the Poetry Center. How many of you are, in, in, are aware of the Poetry Center at the U of A? And, and, and things that it does. And how many of you have ever been there? Okay, we're gonna make that, we're gonna change that this year. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that's a little story about the history and how I, how I know Tyler and, and how um, I've been looking forward to this moment of inviting him to our school. The other thing that I get to do every, well, every now and then is I get to hear some of Tyler's poetry once in a while. And last summer, his students huddled around, and it was, at, it's the, it was at the 4th of July parade, believe it or not. And um, Gambier is such a wonderful town that they have a poet read a, a poem to begin the 4th of July parade. And all of his students huddled around, and they all were hushed. And they all listened to this beautiful poetry that invoked nature. And it was really, really wonderful. And what I admired most about that moment was his poem, but I also admired how his students hushed and listened and created this kind of sacred space once he started to read his poetry. And that blew me away. And I, and I happened to be near them. And it was just a really cool experience to admire him next to his students while, while they were admiring him. So Tyler has many, many accomplishments in his life. And um, mostly today, he's going to talk to you about poetry. Um, he's been on staff at Kenyon College? Yes. The editor of the Kenyon Review? A managing editor. Managing editor of the Kenyon Review. And now he's here um, to, to um, put his mark on uh, the Poetry Center and Tucson. And today he's here to share with us. So please give him a big welcome. We're going to try to use no microphone, and you guys will have to wave at me if you think I'm not being loud enough, or say, please speak up, and I will work on doing that. Um, we do do field trips, and so if you get the itch, if you get excited about what we're talking about today, and you want to come visit the Poetry Center, um, my friend Renee is with me today, and we, she runs all of the field trips that we do at the Poetry Center, and so if you're excited about this, we would love to have you guys come and visit us there. Um, how many people, again, have, seen, have been to the Poetry Center? A few of you have. You have. Good. Can you describe it to everyone else? There's a lot of books there. That's one of the things about the Poetry Center that's right. There are a lot of books there. How many do you think? That's really good. 36,000. We've collected a few more maybe from when you were there, but that's really close. It's almost 50,000 now. Um, and they're all books of poetry. So they're not intimidating necessarily because they're all about this big, which is exciting in some ways about poetry. <laughs> Perhaps one of the things that's exciting. But, um, but there's a lot of books. They're all beautiful books. And we, at one point we were trying to think some books, books of poems maybe have about 60 poems in them, let's say, on average. And if there's 50,000 books, this is so many poems. This is almost millions and millions of poems that are in there on the shelves that are waiting for people to discover. Good. Okay. Good. Um, well, so my name is Tyler, and I, I am the new executive director. I've been in Tucson for four months. Everything is still really new to me. I'm still learning about how to handle cactus, uh, how to handle heat, um, and what mountains are all about. Ohio is very flat. You can imagine Ohio. Is anyone from Ohio? 
Oh, good. Yeah, it is flat, right? Yeah. Pretty flat. So, um, so things are exciting for me uh, to think about waking up and seeing mountains and seeing mountains in all directions and being excited about them. Um, what I thought we would do, I, I want to start by telling you guys a joke, uh, and then I want to, and then I want to talk a little bit about um, poetry with you guys. Um, so this is a joke I want to start with, and I want to use it as a way. I know you're thinking about in these mission days about connections or ideas about connections, how things connect, how one thing connects with something else. So this is what I wanted to start with. So a student and his teacher are on a walk, and they're in the woods. And all of a sudden, it starts raining pretty intensely. And they, they get lost from each other. And they're walking around. And, and then there's, there's suddenly a, a flowing river, a big flowing river. It's flowing really fast. It's like, like a wash full of water. Scary times, right? Really, really busy water. And the student looks over. He's on one side. He's getting a little nervous. He doesn't see any bridges. Um, he does not have a boat with him. Uh, which is a complicated thing to take with you all the time, to have a boat in your back pocket. So he doesn't have a boat, he doesn't see any bridges, and he looks up, and all of a sudden he sees his teacher, and his teacher's on the other side of the river. And he says, teacher, how do I get to the other side? And the teacher looks up at him and says, you're on the other side. <laughs> and this, this is going to be the idea that, one of the ideas that we talk about, and this is one of the things that I think is interesting. Thanks for laughing at a joke that is maybe funny or not funny. Particularly... <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, but the, the idea that uh, one thing I think that poetry can do is it can kind of help us know where we are. And it can let us know sort of where we are right in, in a particular moment. Um, and that's one thing that I think it does really well for us. It connects us to our place and it connects us to a moment. And sometimes it connects us to an emotion or a feeling that, um, that we didn't know we were having or that's hard to have. And it lets us know a little bit about, about what we're, how we feel, what we're, where we are. So, okay. Keep that, just put that joke in the side of your mind, and we're going to come back to that idea a little bit later. Um, so poetry. How many of you, so, so I want to, let's play a game really quickly, and this will be a useful way for us to start. And I just am interested in what your guys' ideas are. So let's pretend for a moment that I have just, I've just arrived, I've, just this morning, I've, uh, I've, I've come down from Mount Lemmon for the first time in my entire life. I've been living on Mount Lemmon by myself, not in Summer Haven, although that would be okay. Um, but I've, I've been by myself, and I've never seen a poem before. I have no idea. I've not seen a lot of things. In fact, this is the first time I've seen a school um, in this game that we're going to play. So, I've never seen a poem before. How would you tell me what poetry is or does? How would you describe it to me? How do you begin to talk about it? Yeah. Well, you say your names. Uh, Dennett. Dennett? Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. I especially like you said that they don't have to be perfect, which really makes me feel good as someone who tries to write poems. Um, how many of you have written poems before? Oh, so many of you have. Very good. Okay. So you all have permission not to be perfect. Dennett has said so. So that's really good. Okay. Other things. That's really good. Right? A, a, a series of words uh, that maybe describes a mental or emotional scene. Yeah. What was your name? Um, Lucia. Lucia. Hi. Um, Um, yeah, this is right. It is kind of hard to describe, isn't it? It's a way of writing, but it's it's it does something that's a little bit different than other writing. It's it's different. Do you want to do you want to keep it and maybe come back? Okay, we'll come back to you. Yeah, what's your name? Connor. Connor, hi. Hi. Um, it's a way. I think it's a way of like. Uh, of making things that you would need, but making them a little bit more fun to read and more interesting to read. More fun to read, more interesting. Yeah. A way to talk about something in a, uh, that's more fun, more interesting, that's a little bit different. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Savannah. Hi, Savannah. There's an in-depth way of saying your emotions. An in-depth way of saying your emotions? These are all really good. These are all things that I think poetry can be. Yeah. What's your name? Isabel. Isabel. A way to describe what you're feeling and what you've seen, and that's maybe different and, and than, say, writing a journal or writing a story. Yeah. yeah. It can be exaggerated sometimes? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. 
sharing your point of view. Yeah, sharing your particular point of view, right? The way you see something in particular as opposed to maybe um, what everyone else sees, right? Your own way of seeing it. You look at the top of, or you look at two clouds and you say, those look like two jelly beans um, doing jumping jacks. Or whatever you think it is, right? And that's your particular way of seeing it. And, uh, and no one else might see it exactly the same way. And that's one thing that a poem can do, it can capture that. Yeah, what's your name? Leah. Hi, Leah. Yeah, that's a great idea. So a poem can give you a feeling, right? It, can't, it doesn't always describe the feeling when you write it, but sometimes you read a poem, and a poem is an experience for you, right? And that's the thing that you feel, and it changes maybe how you feel before you started the poem. It makes you feel something different. Uh, you realize something that you didn't always, you weren't thinking about before you started reading it. And that's the thing that a poetry, a poetry can do as well. These are great answers. Yeah? And it's Dennett, right? Yeah. Good. We, and it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Yeah. That's what I'm going to remember from Dennett. It's doorway to anything. <laughs> it's doorway to anything or anywhere you want in words. A doorway to anything. Say it again. Anything and anywhere you want to go in words. That's really good. Yeah. A poem is a doorway. A poem is a doorway. Yeah. What's your name? Hey, Zach. This is really good. And why is this? Why, why, would, why can it be different for any person who reads it? Uh, the poetry could be, yeah, it could be strange or hard to, to piece together. It could be like a puzzle to think about. It. Yeah, yeah. And it could be, and also because we're all, we're all different. I'm not you, you're not me. The way you read something might be different from the way I read it. Your experiences that you bring to that moment of reading a poem uh, are different maybe than the ones that I bring. I just came off of Mount Lemon for the first time ever this morning in this idea, or this, this game that we're playing. So yeah, we would have different experiences of how a poem, how a poem does what it does. Yeah? Yoni? Yoni. Hey, Yoni. Don't poems usually have a lot of metaphors? Don't poems usually have a lot of metaphors? What do we think? Do we agree? Yeah. 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 Often they can. It depends. Yeah, but they can. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, similes, metaphors, idioms, you guys know all the good words. So, so yeah, so figurative language, right? Language that sometimes makes leaps, that makes your brain leap from one place to another, that maybe relates two things that are different together. And a poem has the ability to do that in a way that sometimes regular speech doesn't. So if I say, um, you know, if I say I feel like a sunflower, that maybe is something that fits really well in a poem. That maybe my wife might say, what's wrong with you? We need to go to the doctor right away. <laughs> I'm worried about your health, but in a poem that might be a way to tell you something about how I feel, and it might be a way to describe it in a different way. So yeah, figure it out. Yes. Hey, Sedona. Yes. Use patterns. Yeah. So what, tell me, say more about patterns. What do you recognize in like? That's right. So. Playing with how things sound, or the shape of things, what they look like. If you, if you group things into couplets, or quatrains, or if, you, if it's one big giant piece of text, or if it's words, they spread out across the page, and there's a lot of white space in between. Yeah, they can play with those shapes to change how the words do their work. Yeah, what's your name? I'm Maddie. Hey, Maddie. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely can. Yeah, it can let you, so right, it's a way to sometimes get a handle on how you're feeling when you don't even, sometimes you don't know. You're not sure if something feels strange, you start writing, and then you realize it helps clarify what you were thinking. Um, you didn't know until you started putting words onto a piece of paper. Yeah. Yes? Yes, poems also can tell stories. This is really good. We've got such a broad range for what poems can do, and I think that this is exactly right. Um, it can do all of these different things. The container for what a poem is and what poetry can do is really large. 
And we all, I think, collectively have a really strong sense of what's possible in the space for, for what, a poem, what a poem can accomplish. Um, and that sometimes, uh, sometimes it can feel like a poem tells a story, and maybe sometimes it feels like a poem spends less time feel, telling, telling a story and tells more about uh, a, an emotional state or a situation. Um, so yeah, this is really good. I want to show, let's save, save these questions. These are really good, and I love the way we're sort of reaching broadly, and this is really exciting for me. Um, and sometimes I want to bring you guys in to talk with some of the other people that I talk to about poetry, because you're really good at all the different things poetry can do. Um, I brought some examples with me that I wanted to read with you, and some things that I wanted to share about what I'm really excited that, um, that poetry does. Just four quick ideas, um, and these are not the only things that it does, but these are some of the things that I'm really excited about that poetry can do. So one thing that I think that it does really well, we've talked about this a little bit, it, describes, it can describe a situation in only the way that you see it, right? In only the way that you see it. So your sense of what something looks like, your vision of what it, what it may look like, when you write that poem, you're the one who has seen it that way. And that's one thing that a, that a poem can do. It can deliver that message to us. So the poem that I wanted to read to you guys really fast, I wish I had these all in my mind but I'm going to cheat and read them off paper. This is a poem by a poet named Wallace Stevens. And this is a famous poem. Some of you may know it. It's called 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. Does anyone know this poem? Do you know this poem? Have you heard it before? OK, good. Or are you just like Blackbird? I've heard it, but I think I've heard poems. You've heard of it. OK, very good. And there's a few poems like this that Wallace Stevens wrote. There's also a poem called Variations on a Summer Day that's very similar to this as well. And these are 13 different ways of seeing what a blackbird is or what it can do. Do you guys know this poem in the back? Some of these older faces? No. OK, good. OK, so here goes. I'll read it to you guys really quickly. Each section is a has a different number. So you, when I get to 13, you'll know we're almost done. So if you're feeling like, oh, man, he's still reading, and you know as soon as I get to 13, it's almost over. OK? Um, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. Among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of a blackbird. I was of three minds, like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. Three. The blackbird whirled in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. Four. A man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a blackbird are one. What? What? <laughs> Five. I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of windows, the blackbird whistling, or just after. Six, icicles filling up the long window with barbaric glass, the shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro, the mood traced in the shadow, an indecipherable cause. Seven, oh thin men of Haddam, why do you imagine golden birds? <coughs> Do you not see the, how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women about you? Eight. I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms, but I know, too, that the blackbird is involved in what I know. Nine. When the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. Ten. At the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the bods of euphony would cry out sharply. It's a funny one. 11. <laughs> he rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. 12. The river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. 13. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. Thirteen different ways of thinking or seeing a blackbird, but each one is a different perspective on what the bird is and maybe what it does, or how seeing one changes how you feel, or how seeing one makes you feel something entirely other, some other way of being in the world. And this is the thing that I think poetry can do really well. It can give us that idea that the way we see something is a special and particular way, and a poem is a good way to capture that, is a way that we can talk about that. That's one of the things I wanted to share with you guys. I thought it was a question. No, it's okay. It's just a very tired blackbird. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, good. Okay. So another thing that I want to say to you guys, so another thing that poetry can do, and you guys hinted at this as well, I think poems can talk 
about things that are hard to talk about sometimes, hard to talk about in other ways. They can address things directly that are sometimes hard to address. That we don't even, maybe we're not sure how we feel when we want to talk about that, or maybe there's an idea that's hard to talk about, something that's difficult. Um, poetry can be a way of trying to talk about that or think about that. Um, I have a poem that I'm going to share about that too. And this is by a poet named Theodore Rutke. And this poem is, um, is a poem about this idea of spirit. He talks about this idea of spirit. And spirit could be a lot of different things. And I like to think of it as when you feel something really strongly inside you. Things like when you're really angry like Maddie was talking about. Or when you're really happy. Or when something sad happens. Uh, that these, something that sort of overwhelms. And you feel it inside you really strongly. Um, and how, here's how this poem goes. And I think that this is a thing, again, poetry can do these kinds of things, can talk about things that are hard to talk about in other ways. This is called A Light Breather. <coughs> the spirit moves, yet stays. It stirs as a blossom stirs, still wet from its bud sheet, slowly unfolding, turning in the light with its tendrils, plays as a minnow plays, tethered to a limp weed, swinging, tail around, nosing in and out of the current. Its shadows loose, a watery finger. It moves like the snail, still inward, taking and embracing its surroundings, never wishing itself away, unafraid of what it is. A music and a hood, a small thing singing. That poem so much. Um, this idea, poems can, can help us talk about things that are hard to talk about. It's hard to talk about. What is spirit? How do you talk about that? Um, poems can be a way for us to try to think about that in a different space, in a different way of, of thinking about what it can be or what it does. Um, okay, another idea. This is, there's four. Those were two. Number three. Poems can help us with things, with questions, big questions that we have. They can be a place for us to explore big questions and wonder uh, what, what, how, how does, what's the right answer? What is, what's the answer to this big question? Sometimes not providing an answer, sometimes just helping us think about what the question means and maybe why we're asking it. Uh, and I think poetry can do this really well. They can connect us in this way. Um, the poem that I want to read to you guys is a poem by a, a writer who's also from Kenyan uh, named James Wright. And, um, and this is a poem about a guy who lies in a hammock. Has anyone ever spent, has anyone, does anyone have a hammock in their house? You do. Some of you do. You could, okay, so you've had this, have you spent significant time in the hammock? No. Yes. No. Yes. Good. Okay. I'm going to need your help in, in, in this, with this poem really quickly. This is a, a relatively short poem. We'll read it really fast and talk about it. This is called Lying in a Hammock at William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. That's a really long title. The title is Lying in a Hammock at William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine, behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. Wow. That last, I know. It, that, there was a noise back there, like they agreed or disagreed. Um, <laughs> what an amazing last line, right? You get all this beautiful description about what's happening as he's lying in this hammock, and then, you, and then that last line comes, and you think, wow. That last line, it sort of changes what everything in the poem could be about. It's not unlike how that joke worked in the very beginning, right? where the, the last line of the joke is the one that makes the joke funny, right? It's a story, but then you depend on that last line, we call it the punchline, right? The punchline is the one that makes you, that makes the, makes the whole poem twist, right? It makes the joke suddenly funny, changes what the poem can mean. Sometimes poems work that way. I like this poem because what I like to think about is there's two possibilities here. So one possibility may be that uh, he's lying in a hammock, he's spending a lot of time in this hammock, and, and he thinks, 
I'm spending my whole life in this hammock. I've wasted my life. All I do is lay around in this hammock noticing the beautiful things at William Duffy's farm, and I've wasted my life. I need to get up and go do something. That could be one idea, right? The other idea could be, I have not spent nearly enough time in this hammock noticing everything that is beautiful at William's farm. It's an amazingly great place. Even, even the droppings from the horses look beautiful. That's one of the lines in the poem, right? Even those blaze up in golden stones. I have wasted my life. I haven't spent enough time in this hammock. Let me read it one more time, and then I want you to think about this. Which one do you think it is? Too much time in a hammock? Not enough time in a hammock. These kinds of things are interesting. This is, these sort of questions are the ones that poems can ask us. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine, behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. So, okay, a quick vote. Too much time in the hammock. Who thinks he spent too much time in that hammock? He needs to go do something. Very few of you. Okay, interesting. Good. How many people think he hasn't spent enough time in the hammock? That's what he's sad about. Yeah, good. This is a lesson. Maybe we should all go spend more time in hammocks. And we should, we should tell our teachers that's an appropriate field trip. Don't tell them that. They won't like that. Um, Poems can, ask, poems can ask these questions. One thing that I like about this poem, it doesn't, it doesn't tell us which one is the right way to feel. And, and there may be different times where you feel the different ways. You may read this poem again. You know, we, we pointed out that sometimes when, you, when different people read poems, they have different experiences. Sometimes when you read a poem at different times, you're the person that has a different experience. It might mean something else the second time you read it, or a different time in your life when you read it. Um, I felt both ways about this poem. I sometimes have felt that I need to spend more time in hammocks, and I've sometimes felt that I haven't spent nearly enough time in hammocks. Um, so that's one thing that I think poetry can do. It can ask big questions uh, and let us, help us think about what's, what's important in asking them. Um, so we talked about poetry can describe things that only we can see, the special way that we see them. We talked about that poetry can address things that are hard to address, that feel difficult to address. Poetry can be a space where big questions get asked sometimes not answered, but they help us think about why the questions are important. And another thing I think poetry does really, really well is that it can play. It can be a thing that plays. Um, in my old job that I had, before I moved to Tucson, I used to have to drive a lot in my car, and it was devastatingly boring. Uh, and eventually the radio station was, it, it went out into rural Ohio, and eventually I lost the radio stations even. And sometimes, so then I would just suddenly be totally quiet driving to this job. And to, as a way to use that time, interestingly, or ways that I, I felt like were interesting, I tried to memorize poems in the car, which was fun to do, to say things out loud in the car. And so this is a poem that I worked on trying to memorize in the car, mostly out of boredom. But I'm really happy that I have it in my mind. It's a poem that I've loved so much. Uh, and it's from a poet who I think works with language and words really playfully. And his name is uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins. And he, his poems have, it sounds like, if, if the words were balls, it sounds like he's throwing balls up in the air the whole time. And so this is called the windhover. A windhover is, is a type of bird. And you may recognize a little bit of this in the poem. And it's, it's for, similar to, say, like uh, a hawk or a, um, uh, a bird of prey. Harris hawks. People have noticed harris hawks. You've maybe been to the Desert Museum and seen them where they do their, the, the bird releases. You've seen them. Yeah, very good. So the windhover would be similar to that kind of way. And he's thinking, oh, this is an amazingly beautiful bird, and I'm going to write this poem about this beautiful bird. But in a way that I think is really playful. And it goes, um, I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight, dolphin, dapple, don, drawn, falcon in his riding of the rolling level, underneath him heavy air and striding high there. How he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing, then off, off, Forth on swing till a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. The hurl and gliding rebuff the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird. The achieve of, the mastery of the thing. 
brute beauty and valor in act, O oh, air, pride, plume, here, buckle, and the fire that breaks forth from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more fruitful, O oh, my chevalier, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you get it, right? But what's fun about this, right? You can see he loves words that sound, I mean, the crazy sounds are a thing that he loves. I can imagine him writing these and just thinking, I, I, he's also very, I think a very intense person, but that he loved playing with words, how they smash together, what they sound like when they're all strung together. That playfulness is a thing that I think poetry can do. Sometimes if you act that playful in regular speech, you know, if you go into your parents in the morning and you, and you start talking like that, they're going to worry about you. Um, <laughs> but in a poem, it's, it's fun. It's a way you can play. And it's an exciting way that you can talk about maybe how you feel. And in this one, right, so he's talking about this bird, the majesty of this bird. He sees he's so impressed by what it looks like up in the sky. And he uses this sort of flood of words as a way to describe how, um, how special that experience is for him in a playful way. So that's another thing that I think poetry can do. Those four things I wanted to say, and they all relate to this idea about how we connect to a place or to a moment, to who we are, to how we feel in a particular, uh, a particular moment, some instruction about um, what, how, we, what, what, how we're connected to our spot. How, so ideas, poetry can help, help describe something that only you see. It can help address things that are hard to address. It can help us think about big questions, not always answers, but why we ask big questions and why those questions are important. And there can be a, a space where we play. And I think that those, those four things were things I wanted to share with you guys about that. Um, I, work, I work at the Poetry Center, um, and it's an, amazing, it's an amazing place to think about what a poetry center is and why we might need one. Um, there are other types of centers. There are medical centers. Those are good centers. Um, they're really good centers. Uh, other, do you guys, can you think of other centers? Yeah. There are um, libraries or sort of centers? Libraries can be a center. That's good, yeah. A convention center. That's really good, yeah. Learning centers? Science centers. Sports centers. These are all good centers. We could keep going. Why do you guys think that we need a poetry center? What would you say? Because poetry is important. I need to take you to the dean that I work for and have you talk to her. That's, that's right. I think you're right. I think poetry is really important. What else? What, and so, if we don't have a center, maybe we don't always think about how important it is. It's a way to remind ourselves that it's really important. I will tell you guys, the poetry center that's here in Tucson, there's not many like it. It's, one of, it's a really special place. There's not many like it in the world. Um, there's, there's a few other places that are similar to what they do, but this one's here in Tucson. It's one that's close to us. And it's, it's an amazing place. And, and because it exists, it's the thing that can remind us that poetry is important. What, there were other hands. Were there other ideas about why we need a poetry center? Yeah? Poetry like, can change people's lives sometimes. And so if we don't have a center to give people, number one, give them access to poetry, yes. and number two, as you said, make them realize You still my heart? Very good, yes. Um, if poetry is a door to anything or anywhere you want, does that mean if poetry is a door you also unlock your mind? People could become enlightened if they look at poem and they finally discover what's true meaning is. This is really exciting. I like the sort of science fiction element that we're getting to. That there's a door through which we may go. Uh, or time travel. So this is very good. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, so poetry, another thing that you could say about it is, it's not, um, one reason that I think it's really important is it's not, it's not, let's say, it's not a very lucrative thing. Uh, and so we need a poetry center as a way to help support it because it's, a, it's an art form that if we don't support it, uh, the people who write it and the people who publish books and make books, uh, the people who talk about it, um, they all need these types of support that a poetry center can give them so that they, so they can continue to make more poems, uh, so that people continue to make more books. Um, and that's another reason that it's really important. It helps nurture a fragile thing. There's a way in which poetry can be fragile. It can be really strong in some ways, 
but it can also be really fragile in other ways. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. We have a big building at our poetry center, and we have a big building because we have a lot of books, like we talked about before. Almost 50,000 books, almost 70,000 total things, poetry things that are there, some recordings, some special posters that have a poem on them, other things like that. So we have a big space to hold all of those things. But one of the things, once this big building, it's relatively new, and once it was built, one of the things we also started to have were a lot more programs and a lot more ways. So we, we host field trips to the Poetry Center and we, have, uh, we take uh, uh, visiting poets who come to visit us and do readings at the Poetry Center. They come and they, they come to a reading and then they go out into schools and talk to students at schools. Um, we have classes and workshops where people come in who are interested in studying a particular thing about poetry and come in and take classes. So there's now, it's not just a building, it's also a group of people. It's a group of people who are really excited about it. So this idea of what a center is, it's a thing, it's a building, and it's a place, but it's also now a group. And people, it grows as people get more excited about it and as, as uh, poetry becomes a thing that becomes important to people who come and participate in it. And that's one of the magical things that I think a center can be. And it's one of the reasons why when you have a center, you can do sort of amazing things by getting people excited about, uh, about what the center is, uh, thinks is important. And for us, it's poetry. And I hope you guys will come and visit with us uh, and, and have some... Uh, have an experience. Come, come, come. Let us talk to you about poems. I would love to see you there. So if you come, say I want to talk to Tyler, uh, and I will come down, and we can go, and I'll give you guys, or we'll show you around, and show you the places that we have. Um, I'm going to read. There's one last poem that I wanted to read, and then I'm just going to read a few of my poems. This is there's a, about 15 minutes or so. Is that right? About 10 minutes. Okay, very good. That's perfect. Um, I know you guys are thinking about connections. I just want to share this with you. So one of the things that a center can do, one of the things we recently did, Arizona has its first state poet laureate. Uh, and this is a poet named Alberto Rios. And he had his first reading as the state poet laureate at the Poetry Center. It was really exciting for us to be able to sort of help launch him. And a poet laureate's job can be a lot of different things. And, and poet laureates in some ways get to think about what they want to do. But his role will be to think about what sort of ways do we talk about poetry? How do we get more people talking about poetry? And he has a really great poem that I think is, uh, uh, underscores this idea about connections that you guys are thinking about. And I want to read this to you really quickly. Uh, and then I'll just read a couple of my poems and we can be done. And you won't have to think about poems if you don't want to for a while. But I hope you will. Not true. Um, not true. <laughs> you will have to think about poems a little bit. Um, this is called Lineas Fronterizas, or Borderlines. And so Alberto Rios was born in Nogales. He teaches now at Arizona State University. Uh, but he grew up along the border between the United States and Mexico. And this is a poem, a little bit about what a border is, or, or um, how, what, what it could be. And he's written it in Spanish and in English. And you'll forgive me for not having very good Spanish pronunciation. I'm working on it very hard. Um, I'm going to read the English part. Um, and then uh, we can talk a little bit about it. Okay. And it's uh, Lineas Fronterizas, Borderlines. A weight carried by two weighs half as much. The world on a map looks like the drawing of a cow in a butcher's shop. All those lines showing where to cut. The drawing of the cow is also a jigsaw puzzle showing just as much how very well all the strange parts fit together. Which, may, which, we, which way we look at the drawing makes all the difference. We seem to live in a world of maps, but in truth, we live in a world made not of paper and ink, but of people. Those lines are our lives. Together, let us turn the map until we see clearly the border is what joins us, not what separates us. 
And so for, for Alberto Rios, this is an exciting idea about connections, right? That this idea, the differences between us as people, what makes us different, what makes us different from our brothers and sisters, from our classmates, from our parents, from the people we see at the grocery store, those differences, those borders, he would say, aren't the lines where we become different. They're the lines where we touch. They're the lines where there's, where there's a connection, where something is made that, can, uh, that, uh, that connects us to, to the world, to all the things that we are collectively together. So a, a poem that I wanted to leave you with about connections from Alberto Rios, a poet laureate who read at the Poetry Center. This is another good thing that a Poetry Center can do. It can host spaces for the poet laureate to talk about what poetry can be and does. Um, I'm going to read you guys uh, just a, a, a few quick of my own poems. Things, and Ms. Field asked me to read a couple of these, and so I will do this quickly as just a last gesture for you guys. This is a poem I wrote about that small town in Ohio when I was leaving it, and I was trying to think about how to, how to say goodbye to this place. Um, and it's called Index of What I Have Loved. The lightning bugs above the field as if the beans are loose, ascending. To use the town like a mirror and recognize all yourselves out there in it. The day lilies act like dads from the ditch. They are all card-carrying members of the angels' union. All our stories make us into better versions of ourselves. And this, in turn, leads to better stories. This is how the first library was invented, in a place like this. And a place where the sky goes polyurethane and we use the chorus, we are never not singing to polish it. Here is some old man joy that I have found inside myself, not knowing it was there, biding its time for the old man to become. How a hummingbird holds a moment clearly and then triples itself. This is a scientific phenomena known as midnight on the water or minniness. The fiddle was invented by a man who walked his pale horse past an apple orchard in bloom. Garden rows gone straight, a mohawk of potatoes, punk roughage. This is how you break a tie, an abacus made out of the eyes of the person you love, and add. Sometimes a smile like a jailbreak to keep time by cicadas or comets. Sometimes a boy taking apart a feather so that he can understand how the sky works. A town like a get well soon card from your head to your heart. A card to open when you need it. Here is a tree frog climbing the trellis of night. Here is your mail. So that was a poem I was trying to think about how to say goodbye to a place that I really liked. And it was hard. That, that idea, we talked about how a poem can sometimes uh, help you describe something in only a way that you can see it. And that was the way that I was seeing that town in that moment. Uh, and I realized when I was writing that poem that I had questions about it that I didn't even know. And so it was a way for me to think about that too. Um, I think the, the, maybe we'll just close it off there. Thank you guys so much for listening to all of these different ideas and for listening to poems. It's fun to read poems in the middle. I'm going to remember this clapping for after staff meetings when I meet you. <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions about, um, about poetry or the Poetry Center or things that we can keep talking about? Any things you guys are thinking about? You guys said you were writing poems. You raised your hands. You had written some poems. Are you guys writing poems in class? You are. What have you guys been writing about? <coughs> What's that? <laughs> say, say it louder. A lot, A lot of stuff. OK, good. <laughs> I mean, um, are there, are there what, what kinds of things? Tell me. Yeah. Yeah, Dennis. Um, I wrote poems in class last year, but I stopped for a while. Yeah. And I would write them after, you know, when the class was about to end and there wasn't anything left to do. Yeah. Um, but in English class, we were writing poems as an assignment, and um, I learned a lot about uh, first of Shakespeare's poems. Oh, wow. Yeah. And And how you, the same words. How you work. Yeah, okay. Very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this year, we, uh, last year we learned a lot more about poems, but this 
year, I think there's only been one, right, Israel? Where we, where we just got a bunch of words and we had to make a poem with it. Out of the words you got. Words we got we so you just had to deal with whatever words you got. Well, we got the words and we had to use all of them, and then we could add more words, but you had to use all the words that were given. I see. This is a very good practice. I like this. Yeah. Whatever comes to your mind. Whatever comes to your mind. That's a good way to write. Um, and, it, and especially if a lot of things are coming to your mind. My problem is some things don't always come to my mind. So but that's a great way to do it. Yeah? Um, I wrote a poem about uh, different ways you can look at things. Uh-huh. The different ways. And that's maybe kind of like the Wallace Stevens poem about looking at a blackbird different ways. Yeah, I mean, I wrote Good. right now. Oh, just right now. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> Well, I will, I will welcome all of you guys to come to the Poetry Center. We would really love to have you. Uh, and so, uh, so think about it. And I, I hope that you guys come and make a visit. It's a really great place. Uh, there's a lot of fun things there, uh, a lot of great things about poems. And we would love to have you there. Thanks for having me come visit with you guys.